Hi class, in this lecture we want to talk about uh, two rules. We first want to talk about the addition rule and then we're going to talk about complements or the complement rule. So this lecture is going to have three objectives we're going to work for. We're going to talk about uh, using the addition rule for disjoint events. So we'll first talk what it means in probability for two events to be disjoint. Then we'll talk about the general addition rule um, and there's some interesting examples there. And then we're going to compute the probability event using what's called the complement rule. Complement rule is pretty straightforward, and you've actually have all probably used the complement rule without even realizing it uh, was called the complement rule before. Okay, so let's start with the addition rule for disjoint events. Okay, so what are disjoint events? So two events are disjoint if they have no outcomes in common. Another name for disjoint event is mutually exclusive. Another way to say disjoint here is they, uh, the events can't happen at the same time. Like if you roll a six-sided die, okay, two events are disjoint if the one event E is you roll an even number and another event F is you roll an odd number. Okay, these are disjoint. All right, because it can't happen at the same time. All right, so we often draw pictures of events using Venn diagrams. Uh, so you might remember Venn diagrams from a previous math course in high school um, or you know, a, a lower level math course in college here. But uh, so these pictures represent events as circles enclosed in a rectangle. Okay, so the rectangle below here, this rectangle represents the sample space. Okay, so blue rectangle is the entire sample space. Okay, and each circle inside it represents a specific event. So for example, suppose we randomly select a chip from a bag and where a bag where each chip is in the bag is labeled with the numbers zero through nine. So there's 10 of them. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's 10 different chips in there. So we're gonna let the event E um, represent the event choose a number less than or equal to two. Well, this is E, okay? And you can see that the circle E encompasses the outcomes you get, one, two, zero, one, and two. And we're gonna let F here be choose a number greater than or equal to eight, which is the numbers eight or nine. The other elements that are not in these E or F are represented outside the circles in the Venn diagram. And you can see these events are disjoint because the circles do not overlap. They have no common outcome. All right, so let's compute some probabilities. Like, what if I say, what is the probability of event E? Well, it's the number of ways E can occur divided by the total number of outcomes. Well, that's just three divided by 10 or 0 0.03. If I say, hey, what's the probability of F? Well, there's two ways F can happen, 10 possible outcomes. That's two divided by 10 or 0 0.2. All right, so now what if I say, hey, what is the probability that E or F happens? Okay, so now we're introducing the or statement. So here, it's just the number of ways that you can have E or F, okay, divided by the total number of outcomes. Well, look, there's three ways, three things in E, two things in F, okay? Being E or F, you take these three plus two, there's five ways that you can get a number or an outcome, excuse me, that's in E or F, divided by 10, because that's the total number of outcomes, that gets you 0 0.5. So you can kind of see what I did here with the or statement. The or statement here kind of implied addition right there. So you can see just breaking it up, it's just the probability of E plus the probability of F. So 0 0.3 plus 0 0.2 got me 0 0.5. Perfect, perfect. So this is important. If events E and F are disjoint or mutually exclusive events, then if I ask you what's the probability that E or F happens, you just add the two separate probabilities. Okay, this works if they are disjoint. Okay, they cannot occur at the same time. All right, so the addition rule for disjoint events can be extended to more than two disjoint events. So in general, if E, F, G, so on and so on, each have no outcomes in common. Okay, so they're all pair, what we call pairwise disjoint. So there's no overlap among any of them. Then if I ask you, hey, what's the probability of E or F or G happening? Well, that's just equal, you take the probability of the first event, E, you add it to the probability of the second event, F, and you keep going, and that's it. 
All right, so let's let's do an example here. So I've got this table here, and it's um, and it lists the number of rooms in housing units, and then their corresponding probability. So what that means is the number of housing units in the United States that have only one room, so like a studio, is 0 0.01 or one percent of houses. That's basically what we're saying here. So you know it looks like the the highest probability housing unit is a housing unit with five rooms and that represents 0 0.219 or 21.9% of housing units. Okay, so anyways, let's verify that this is a probability model here. So what you're gonna do, if you have a table of data here, you're gonna, to verify it's a probability model, you're gonna make sure that all the corresponding probabilities um, are between zero and one inclusive, which they are. There's no, no negative probabilities or there's no probabilities greater than one. And then you're gonna verify that the sum of them all sum up to one, which it does. So I'll save us the time, but if you were to sum all these, they would sum up to one. Okay, so what is the probability that a randomly selected housing unit has two or three rooms? So you see the or statement here, okay? So that's gonna tell me to add, okay? So you, this is where it gets a little wordy, just to be clear. So a housing unit that has exactly two rooms is different from a housing unit that has exactly three rooms, right? Like it's not a cumulative sum here or a cumulative total. So if I want to find the probability of two or three rooms, well, just take the probability that it has two rooms, which is this, and you would add to it the probability of three rooms, which is this. And you can see that the probability that if you were to randomly select a housing unit, the probability it would have two or three rooms is 0 0.125. Okay, what if it has one or two or three rooms? So it's this plus this plus this because it's the or statement. So this or this or this. Well, if you just add up those corresponding probabilities here, you can see that this is just 0 0.135. So if you have a table of data, just add them up. You know, if I give you the or statement. So if it's this or this, just add up their corresponding probabilities if they are disjoint. All right, but now what if the events are not disjoint? Okay, meaning they have a common outcome. Okay, so let's use the general addition rule here, introduce it. So for any two events, E and F, okay, the probability of E or F occurring is equal to the probability of the first event, E, plus the probability of the second event, F. But then if they have common outcomes, to prevent double counting, you have to subtract away the probability that E and F happen. All right, seems a little weird, but let me, let me walk you through an example here. All right, so this is gonna go back to the game of craps, okay? We saw introduced this in a lecture a while ago. So remember, you throw two dice, and you sum the results. Okay, so I have two events here. The first event, E, is the first die that you roll, which is be this one here, is a two. So all of this row here is the first die is a two, because this is a two, 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 and this is a two. All right, but now, so just so we're clear here, E, can happen six ways, okay? Now let's say, let's let F be the sum of the dice is less than or equal to five. Okay, well, that would be this one, this one, this one, this one, it's crazy. This one, which, which is part of E, this one, this one, this one is less than five, less than or equal to five, this one is less than or equal to five, this one is less than or equal to five. And I think we've got them all. So how many ways could that happen? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. F can happen 10 ways, okay? But just how many times did they overlap? Think about that. It looked like they overlapped one, two, three ways. So now if I want you to find the probability of E or F, let's use the general addition rule. So the probability of E, it's a number of ways that could happen. Well, I said there were six ways, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's six out of 36 or one six. 
Probability of f, as you saw, I said there were 10 ways, okay? So that's 10 out of 36, or 5 out of 18. Now the probability of e and f, well, that's just the number of ways that you can have both e and f. That was that overlap I was counting out, those three ways you could overlap. So that's 3 out of 36, or 1 12th. So then the probability of e or f here, well, you would add the first two, but then you'd have to subtract away probability of e and f to prevent that double counting. So it would be 6 over 36, 6 over 36 plus 10 over 36 minus 3 over 36, which would get you 13 out of 36. Because 6 plus 10 is 16, minus 3 gets you 13. All right, let me give you another one. All right, so to help illustrate this subtraction stuff, okay? So let's draw a card from a deck of cards, okay? So this is a standard deck of cards here, uh, and some of it got cut off here, all right? But um, there are four suits in a, in a deck of cards, right? Standard deck of cards. There's the clubs and the spades, the hearts and the diamonds, okay? And each suit has the same exact cards, okay? It has a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, a six, as you can see over there, a seven, an eight, a nine, a 10, and then it also has a jack, a queen, a king, and an ace. Okay, it has all of that. So what I mean is in a standard deck of, of cards, there's 52 cards, and there's four fives, or there's four jacks, or there's four queens. Okay, there's four of every card. All right, so if you draw a single card at random, what is the probability it's a king, a, excuse me, a queen or a king? So ask yourself this, are these events disjoint? All right, so can you draw a card from a deck of cards and have it be both a queen and a king? No, okay, these are disjoint. So it's the probability of a queen plus the probability of a king. Well, there's four queens in a deck, so the probability you draw a queen is four out of 52, plus probability you draw a king, there's four kings, is four out of 52. So this would be eight out of 52, or just two out of 13. Now look at this, this is where it's a little different. Probability of a queen or a spade. Is this disjoint? No, this is not disjoint. Okay, the reason is if you look back, you can draw a queen of spades. Look, it's right there, it's a little cut off, but you can draw a queen of spades from a deck of cards. So you're gonna to have to use that general addition rule. It's the probability of a queen, plus probably draw a spade, but then you're gonna to have to subtract away the probability it's a queen and a spade. Well, there's four queens in the deck. There's 13 spades. And how many cards are both a queen and a spade? One, one, just the queen of spades. So this would be four plus 13 is 17, minus one. This is 16 out of 52, uh, which you could simplify to eight out of 26, or four out of 13 to simplify it even more. All right. so. You just have to you just have to think through the problem here. You you know use your intuition. Um, you know ask yourself are they disjoint or are they not disjoint? All right, now let's end by talking about uh, events using the complement rule. All right, so if we let S denote the sample space of a probability experiment, and we let E denote any event, okay, the complement of E, which we denote as E with the superscript C, so it's E E C looks like E raised to the C is all outcomes in the sample space S that are not outcomes in event E. So like, let me show you uh, what I mean by that. Suppose you roll a die. Okay, here's the sample space. It's the numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six. If event E is equal to a number two or less, that would be one and two right there. That means EC, the complement, 
would be the numbers, everything left over, three, four, five, or six. That's, that's what the complement means. It's everything that's outside of that event. So if, we, if E represents any event, a formula for the complement rule here is, and EC represents the complement of E, then the probability of EC, the probability of the complement, is equal to one minus the probability of event E. So you can see here, here's the entire region that I was talking about, the sample space, the area outside the circle represent EC. Just, just to note here, you can also write this as the probability of any event E is equal to one minus the probability of its complement. Then it's the just a little algebra there. You can add one, one over and subtract the other over. So either one of these formulas work. All right, so let's try this one here. Okay, so according to the American Veterinary Medical Association, 31.6% of American households own a dog. Okay, what is the probability that a randomly selected household does not own a dog? Well, if this is the probability you own a dog, what's its complement? That you do not own a dog, okay? So the probability you do not own a dog is equal to one minus the probability you do own a dog. Well, we know the probability you own a dog, just changing this to a decimal, it's 0 0.316. So just one minus that is 0 0.684. That's it. All right, let's try one last one here. Okay, so the data to the right represents the travel time of work of residents of Hartford, Connecticut. So it's basically their commute time. All right, what is the probability of a randomly selected resident has a travel time of 90 or more minutes? Wow, long time. So what you have here, you see I have all these frequencies here. I don't have it in terms of probabilities. Okay, so what you can do, the first thing you can do is you could find the total by summing this up. And so the probability then that somebody has a commute time, all right, of 90 or more minutes, that's just this one right here. Sorry, it gets a little, little over it, but it's just that number of people who have that commute time divided by the total, which is 0 0.015. So, so a little bit more than 1%. So it's like one and a half percent of people have a 90 minute commute time, which is crazy. That's a long time. So now, compute the probability that a randomly selected resident of Hartford, Connecticut will have a commute time less than 90 minutes. Well, what you could do is you could find the individual probabilities and add them all up. Or you could just do the complement. So the probability of less than 90 minutes, the, the opposite of it, the complement is 90 minutes or more. So that would be one minus the probability we just found. Oh, just went a little too fast there. Or 0.985. All right, class, I hope this helps you going through these. Um, we're going to pick up with some more advanced rules with the next lecture.